Well, this is a real pleasure for me. I, I love doing this particular job of interviewing people, but this is particularly special because I get to interview someone that I am quite familiar with, Aww. Pastor Simon Guevara. Mm -hmm. But full disclosure, from the front end, we are related. <laughs> And this is how we're related, is that his wife is our third born daughter, Alicia. And uh, they have five of the some of the greatest grandkids that I, I could ever imagine, uh, born to them, they're my grandkids, his children, their children. So welcome, Simon. So glad you're join us. Yeah, this thank you, Randy. And uh, thank you for having seven daughters, because it gave me at least one shot, one out of seven. <laughs> I think I took the pick of the litter, but that's that's of course always up for argument, but yeah. Well, let, let me give a little intro of who you are. Yeah. Um, you didn't start out this way, and you're gonna be talking about that. You started out far afield from where you currently are, but you're now an ordained pastor serving in Hinsdale, Illinois. It's a very posh suburb of Chicago. Um, you've came to Christ. You're going to talk about that. that's the exciting story. Yeah. Uh, a little bit later in life, you were not raised a Christian in a Christian family. And uh, it's gonna be fun to hear but uh, you went to Grand Rapids Theological Seminary graduated there you've pastored churches in Michigan, Texas, and now in Illinois. And we, we know you have a heart for evangelism, and uh, you love the Lord, and mm -hmm. you're just full of energy and, oh, and uh, creativity, and it's so, I'm so proud to be your brother in Christ, and also related to you through our dear daughter, Alicia, so welcome yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, thanks, I got a, yeah, great wife and a, and a awesome father-in-law to boot, so I, you, you're kind of the bonus. Oh, well, I yeah. love that. You're so <laughs> kind. Come on. Yeah. But let's let's talk, let, before we get in, you know, our basic theme is, you know, what is God saying to the church here in America? Mm. And we're going to get to that, but I think it's really interesting. Your story is just fascinating. Yeah. You, uh, you weren't a follower of Christ for much of your early life. Why don't you tell that story, would you, Simon? Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, I would say that, yeah, my experience is, uh, you know, begins in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we were uh, a very poor growing up. And the reason was that my grandfather was a migrant farmer. He was kind of running back and forth with the crops. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is back in like the 50s. Um, and he was dragging his family along with him. You would know about this, a growing family. He ultimately had nine children. Wow. And I think there was probably a season where they were bringing them back and forth, you know, again, stopping along the way to pick the crops and heading back down south again. And I know at some point that was just exhausting. I mean, as you'd imagine it was, and you heard about opportunities in West Michigan and factories, and he got a humble, you know, kind of start job at a, a, a factory in Grand Rapids, uh, was the first um, Hispanic Latino to buy a home in a, in a neighborhood uh, that at the time was kind of German working class in the Southwest side. Hmm. Uh, and then we started there, the neighborhood transitions over the decades pretty quickly. I think all the Germans <laughs> moved out and all the Hispanics moved in. Uh, okay. And with that came a lot of, lot of poverty, honestly. There was, hmm. It was really first generation kind of toughing it out with pretty you know, meager kind of uh, work. Um, and then on top of that was some family strife. My dad my mom, uh, I'm the youngest of five, but there's a lot of space between us because there was a lot of space in their relationship. Uh, so I'm the youngest of them, uh, but dad wasn't around when I was growing up. Um, and uh, that, yeah, I was, like I said, I would say culturally religious, you know, at some point, but certainly not, you know, uh, uh, understanding of God and, and grace and Jesus. It was just kind of some statues. Right. Maybe yeah. church education, yeah. So that's how I started, yeah. Um, and, and how I came to Christ uh, from that much later in life is a pretty extraordinary story, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great story. Let's go with it. You were working at a TV station even, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, coming out of the city, you know, I, I really had purpose in my life early on. I feel like God, in assuming that was him, and I didn't know it at the time, had placed sure. this kind of thought in my heart about not wanting to just be another person from the neighborhood, kind of a statistic. You know, as I looked around at a pretty young age, I was like, all right, if you're about 14, 15, you know, you're and, and a guy, you usually you get a girl pregnant, uh, you live in the neighborhood, you just kind of drop out of school, you might sell, you know, drugs on the corner, that kind of stuff. It was pretty, sure. you know, empty. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just really always felt like I didn't belong there. And so I would say that instinct both drove me to try to be more successful and more diligent in my choices, but also at the same time, it's very discouraging. 
because yeah. I just always felt like, well, it's, you know, successful people don't look like me. They don't come from where I come from. And so I was always kind of pulled in sort of two directions of like, do you know, do I want to be a successful person or what does it matter? You know, and that's kind of been a weird sort of sub theme. Uh, but yes, I pulled myself out, uh, went to school, uh, worked, then came back to West Michigan after traveling around for a bit, worked in uh, television there. I worked at Fox 17 uh, back in the 90s. Um, and it was through a relationship with, with a friend uh, that I was introduced to the gospel in the most genuine way I could imagine. And it, it just all, everything fell, fell down. I fell to my knees and surrendered my life to Christ on my 30th birthday, August 20th. Right on their birthday, right on the birthday, right? Right on the birthday night. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's, that was all that was weaved into my story, uh, how God did that. He planted that seed in there early. But yeah, it was total surrender to Christ on my 30th birthday. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then along the way, you met a young lady named Alicia. Yeah. Yeah. Shortly after that, I had, uh, I was discipled pretty intentionally and mm -hmm. began to sense this call towards ministry, but I was like, well, I mean, it's great, but it'd be, you know, better if I had a partner, you know, someone that was that, that at least, sure. you know, had more, more uh, roots in, in the faith and God introduced me through a blind date. Uh, to this amazing, you know, woman. And I remember asking her on our third date, like, why are you still single? You know, uh, yeah. and, and she wasn't for long. We got married 10 months after that first blind date. And uh, Lish is a great, great partner in life, child raising children, and of course, in ministry. It's just, I can't ask for better. Yeah, well, she's, every one of our kids, we have 12 kids, as many of your, the viewers yeah. will know. Uh, but she's our third born. And when you look in your dictionary for strong-willed child, you see her picture. I, yeah. I'm joking, of course, but she, she is, but you know, strong-willed is leadership, just maybe taking a, a notch or two too far. Yeah. And she's an amazing person, follower of Christ, loves the Lord. And uh, we're just so proud of, of her, but certainly of you and love your five kids. Yeah. No, unique. her gifting has served unique. us well as we've done ministry together. We've moved across the country twice. Uh, yeah. we've had, we had five kids inside of six years. And, uh, you know, there's everyone else, nobody who can handle that, but Alicia, really. That's true. No, yeah. that's amazing. Well, yeah. you're, you're a great, uh, great leader of that home and uh, proud of you in the ministry that you're in. Thanks. But let, let's transition to, to where we are as a nation. Um, yeah. You don't need to even watch much news these days and, and just get a sense that, man, such div divisiveness in our country and just a, just a real sense of where in the world is this heading? And, you know, as a parent, especially of kids, I mean, a concern about, you know, the, you know the, all the COVID things that we've been running into. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so what do you see God is trying to say to his people? body the church in america i mean just before i before you turn loose here um you know if you look at china you look at iran you look at some of these other nations where christians are being persecuted even though they're under incredible pressure there's a there's a degree of life there they seem to be growing and and, yeah. and uniting but in america we've had freedom for decades for centuries really yeah and yet we're just kind of lackadaisical. We've been in decline. Churches are closing their doors. And so what, what do you say? What do you, what do you sense the Lord is, is wanting to say to, to us? He loves us, but what is he yeah. trying to say to us? Well, I would, I would first go back to my, my background, you know, okay. growing up in, in kind of inner city poverty, right? Um, I remember my first sort of exposure to politics was there was a guy and a, a couple of people that came into our neighborhood wearing suits and they were walking around the neighborhood and you know, meeting and greeting and, and kissing babies and all that stuff. And I remember like asking my mom, like, what are they doing? And she said, oh, those are uh, politicians. They come around every couple of years and they're really <laughs> smiley and they promise a lot of stuff. Uh, and then you never see them again, you know, and, and it really doesn't matter. I remember saying for sure, like, it really doesn't matter who gets elected. Nothing's ever going to change mm -hmm. for us, you know? Okay. And so that, yeah. that kind of always flavored my, my understanding of politics up until I got to a place of like, okay, now I'm actually buying my own homes and having a family and, and you know, more invested in the community sure. that, uh, that I live in. And so then I, I couldn't just live on that complacency of, well, it doesn't really matter. Um, mm. I started to pay more attention to it. So, uh, but I would say one thing that I see uh, in the church and certainly in, in America as a whole is a tendency towards political idolatry. Political idolatry is like the idea that that somehow government is going to be the god that's going to fix everything. And again, growing up on on public assistance, 
you know, I can see how that mindset kind of sets in quickly. Like if the government doesn't give us, then we don't have. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely see that even on, on people that don't live on in that kind of status, this idea that government is, is like an idol. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about uh, Acts 17, you know, Paul at the Areopagus, where he, you know, he's, he says to the people, you know, look, I can see how extremely religious you are. Right. Um, and, and I think we see that, again, even outside the church, there's a, there's a religion, there's, a, uh, there's doctrine in the wind, in a sense, and there's this following towards this future. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think most people in the U.S., you know, they envision a, a United States that's, you know, prosperous and just and merciful and, and, and you know, it's cleansed itself of racial tension and violence. And, and you know, they're pushing towards that in a very religious, with a religious fervor. Mm -hmm. But it's to a God they don't even know. And that's what I think is interesting with Paul. It's like, you know, I see all these statues, these representations of, of these gods, these favors you desire, but it's to a God you can't even identify. You don't know him. And that's yeah. because the God, the idol of the people is a personless force, a, a progression, a future that, again, we can't, we can't grasp it. We can't touch it. Many times can't even identify it. But so many people are lining themselves up towards that idol, towards that idolatry. And that, that's one thing that I see a lot in our culture right now. Yeah. And, you know, when, when you look to government to being the ultimate um, giver of good and controller instead of God, yeah. I mean, basically it's man organized and then in a position to provide, you know, this sort of leadership and governance and control, if you will, over the population, mm -hmm. but it's man versus God. I mean, there are good, there are some good kings like in the Old Testament. Sure. And they, like Hezekiah and others, they would bow down. They, they realized that above them was God. Uh, again, there's been times in history where the, 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 the expression was the king can do no wrong. Mm -hmm. The king makes the laws. It's a government of people rather than the government of, of laws that are over everyone. And then over that are basically God's law. I mean, that's the way that the, that the, the American English American legal system was formed. Again, my background is law and so yeah. on was that ultimately it looked to the 10 commandments. And then out of that grew man's laws that have to, to parallel or go along with, with God. But ultimately we all report to God. Yeah. I've shared this, I think, before, maybe even on this podcast, but I'll do, I'll do it quickly once again. I, I'm, my background is Dutch, and I don't like to waste money as such, okay, just for the record. But there was a, 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 at least a, a little twinge of delight that I got when I would get a parking ticket, mm -hmm. even as a judge. I didn't like to you know, give the 5 10 whatever it was, $20, but there was something that felt good about me, even though I'm a judge, being under the law. Okay. And that's what, but, but we've lost that. It's now where, where man gets in that position to make the laws and dictate what he believes or she believes is right and wrong. And that's where we begin to lose liberty. Mm -hmm. So again, maybe I'm getting a little, a, a, a field from where you were going with your thought, but. No, I think, me, I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're yeah. reminded that often, uh, and you'll notice this in the news whenever there's a tragedy or, or, yeah. or a trial of any kind, whether it's, you know, a, a mass shooting or, or, or natural disaster. Okay. The tendency is to, hey, we need to see what laws we can pass to ensure that yeah. that doesn't happen again. And, and, exactly. and that's just the instinct of the people right now. Like, all right, let's, this thing happens. What laws do we need to, who's first of all accountable? And then what laws do we need to pass to that? It doesn't happen again. It's even true with like natural disaster, more laws right. about, Hey, we yeah. need to over -religion. And the problem is, you know, we're starting to unbind ourselves, you know, with mm -hmm. all these, these laws that are in intended to keep us free and happy and healthy, but in right. the end, they're just they're crowding us over. And so that's what I mean, you know, in terms of this political idolatry, yeah. you know, the idea is so, that, that through yeah. laws and stuff, we can get to this utopia. So again, if, if God could come and speak either to our leaders of our churches, our pastors, well, yeah. let's just go there if you if you were able to communicate to every uh, true follower of Christ pastor mm -hmm. in America, yeah, what would you like to say? What would you sense that God would like to say to these pastors? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I this is an area that I'm, I'm not necessarily always, you know, uh, versed in. I, I love street evangelism. I love to get mm -hmm. to know my neighbors. But I would say the, the first reminder, and this helps me a lot, 
it gives me a sense of peace is to remember that we are as followers of Christ, we're first citizens of God's kingdom. I and love then it. from that position, that assurance, that safety, we are to seek the welfare of the nation that we live in. You know, I think about uh, Ephesians 2, 19, that, that says, hey, we're no longer strangers or aliens. In other words, we're not disconnected or aliens. And I know a little bit about that from you know my family story. Sure, we're not sure. second class people anymore, right? But instead, he says, Paul says, we're citizens. We are citizens along with the saints. Okay, so that means our passport uh, is actually in God's kingdom. And mm. our fellow citizens are not only our brothers and sisters here, but even the saints, if you imagine that. That's um, really good. But then we're also, he says, members of the household of God, members mm. of the household. So we're citizens of this, along with the saints and members of the household of God. So again, That's that good. means that our primary identity, the passport that we carry should be stamped by our allegiance to God's kingdom first. Yes. And then our connection uh, to the church, which is really God's mission outpost here in the place that he's called us to. And we who are, mm -hmm. are fortunate enough to call uh, the United States of America our home, it's mm -hmm. also our <laughs> mission field. And so, That's good. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, uh, and maybe the other one is to resist. And I'm starting to see this with people that are more, um, you know, in the church, or maybe more conservative, even, uh, we have to resist political complacency. It is like my mom used to say, but in a different way, where now I think many Christians and church leaders kind of feel like, oh, it doesn't really matter. The tide of, of culture is too strong for us to change. So mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter. I'm not going to lend my voice into particular issues because I don't want to offend anyone. Yeah. Um, you know, we have to continue to advocate for values, mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, as we pray, certainly, first of all, for our nation, for our leaders, and then yeah. work so that God's kingdom can be here on earth as it already is in heaven, right? So we're calling on, it. may the yeah. kingdom be here now as it's That's already good. being written and prepared for yeah. us in heaven. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of Christians just say, well, public policy is just so evil. We shouldn't even get close sure. to it. Yeah. So what I do, I break it down and say, so what, is the, what if there's an intersection near your home and there's no stoplights and no stop signs and it's just, and there's accidents and people are injured. Some people die every year. So what you do is you go to the, the your road commission or the, the county commission, whatever it is, and you, you help them install a, a stoplight at this intersection. And the number of injuries and deaths greatly gets reduced. Is that a good thing? To, well, of course, that's, that's a loving, good public policy is loving your neighbor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's getting, you know, principles at work that, that help your neighbor. Yeah, it's public policy, but that's, that's one way to show love to your neighbor. Yeah. And then you can just, you know, escalate that, you know, laws about abortion, sure, unborn sure. children. Should we not work toward that? Of course we should. Yeah, and again, yeah. we do it in a loving way. We don't threaten people. And, and I mean, there's a lot of that going on today where you're just so divisive. We're, we're to do it in love. Yeah, we're to, yeah. to draw people like you do. You're an evangelist. You don't hammer people over the head with a family Bible. You're going to, you know, this sort of thing. Yeah, but you draw them to the truth. And that's how you're to engage as followers of Christ in public policy, to advocate by loving people, even the, those legislators that maybe are way off on another planet, you might say, from you, but you still try to draw them a little bit closer to the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And That's again, I'm, I was saying citizen of, of God's kingdom first, not in a complacent way, right? That doesn't give oh, us no, permission no, to totally. just, oh, I'm going yeah. to heaven. And so, you know, forget it, the world can burn. That is not the posture at all, right? Where our citizenship is in heaven and yes. members of God's household. That's the peace that we operate out of yep. as we serve with grace and truth. Now, here's a, a practical. Let me try to take it out of the theory for a second. And uh, yeah. you know, we have five, five kids, uh, yep. 16 to 10 years old. And so we have two in high school, two in middle school, one uh, finishing up elementary. And in the elementary school, uh, the teacher sent out uh, a, a note saying they wanted to start, you know, addressing some social justice concerns that children themselves had, you know, said they wanted to deal with. And so we looked at the list uh, of social justice issues that the public school teacher wanted to address. And I thought, I mean, I've got a fifth grader. I've had four other fifth graders before that. There's no way that some of these issues are on his mind. He's, he's really just thinking about when can I get a chance to play a video game and, you know, and hang out with my friends. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but so it was a lot of, you know, current kind of cultural issues. One of them in particular was on gender and the idea that, uh, hey, we can teach these fifth graders, you know, uh, to be respectful of people's gender pronouns and preferences and stuff. And I was like, look, I, I get it in terms of, 
you know, how can we be respectful to someone who, you know, wants to be called something different than they are? Okay, I have a wrestle with that, but okay, maybe an accommodation there. But how do you teach kids about the multitude of gender potentials without them thinking it's okay and maybe it's okay for me? You know, it's yeah. kind of an indoctrination. So, so I had to struggle with that because, I mean, obviously sure. I tried to get to know the teachers and faculty in a way that, that encourages them to seek Christ and the light of Christ and see him in me. But now yeah. I've got a problem because I'm like, I need to challenge this, mm -hmm. but I need to challenge it in a way that doesn't disrupt that, you know, potential for witness, right? So that's my balance, right? So yeah. I, I began to, I sent several respectful letters to the teacher to kind of clarify their, you know, uh, their sense of why they're doing this and how they're doing it. And now I'm talking to other parents. And I actually feel that through my advocacy that on this issue, and it's been pretty gentle, I'm actually getting to know even more parents now who want to have this conversation about, boy, this, the world just seems like it's really throwing mm -hmm. a lot at young kids and kind of disorienting their thinking. How can we, we stay on truth? How can we stay on appropriate messages for kids? And, and so actually God is using it to open some doors, uh, literally into neighbors' homes that, that wouldn't have been opened before. Isn't that awesome? That's just great, Simon. Yeah. I'm proud of you for that. that. That's really great. So are you generally optimistic about where things are? Or are you, I mean, a lot of people are just, just totally nervous and upset and just frightened about where things are. What, what would, I mean, what, what's your sense? Where should we be as Christ followers today? Yeah. In light of all the craziness of our culture and government and so on, which, should we be hopeful or should we be pessimistic? I mean, again, as citizens of God's kingdom, if that's the metaphor, that's the, the scripture that sticks for now, yeah. we know it's going to end well. We know it's going to be bad for us in terms of not just our nation, but in the world, there's going to be that tribulation, that trial. But these are the birth pangs. And then yeah. eventually, certainly God's kingdom is going to return. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to yeah. give us all the things that that government is trying to promise but can't possibly sustain, which is a peaceful, just nation yeah. that equally serves its people and everyone's, mm -hmm. you know, loved, uh, gracious. Like it'll never have that without God returning. And so we know it's going to work out. Okay. So out yeah. of the security of that promise and assurance that it's going to be okay, I think hopefully that enlivens the spirit, not discourages the spirit. Yeah. But when you think of birth pangs, you know, I, I think about, you know, as a pastor, I work with, you know, uh, sometimes people that are in terminal situations, you know, where, you know, mm -hmm. someone's you know, sick and they have cancer and, and you know, and, and the end yeah. is near. Now you can, you can, people go about this two ways. There's, there's both the way of, of terminality where they're like, oh, I'm, I'm scared, I'm nervous. And then we work on, you know, assuring them yep. in Christ. But yep. then I've also seen people that who have been terminal that their worship has expanded, their, their pre this presence of God over them has been expanded as they walk to that door of death. It's pretty amazing. So yeah. I'm saying that what, what if, okay, we know the American experiment, it's not the kingdom of God. It should never be right. equated with the kingdom of God. We know at some point, like our physical bodies, it's probably terminal. Is this the season? I, I pray not because I mean, I've got kids that would love to grow and hopefully have fruitful lives. But I pray in faith, knowing that God ultimately wins the story, and we continue to pray just like we would for a sick person for healing in their heart, mind, and soul, and body, the flesh, so that they, you know, God's kingdom continue to be sown. So I'm, I'm very confident in some way that God's going to continue to give us more time mm -hmm. to reach more people. I think he's going to do amazing things, but I also am eye in the sky waiting for Jesus to come back and fix everything. Amen. And that's not bad. That, that's good. I like that. You know, I was thinking of a scripture. Remember uh, the, uh, the the Jewish the, the folks from Judea uh, were captured by the Babylonians, brought to Babylon for seventy years, and uh, you know there you are. There's very un it certainly wasn't Christian, but uh, certainly not God centered culture at all. And uh, God spoke through Jeremiah, Jeremiah twenty nine, to those folks, and He said, "Seek the peace and prosperity of the city." Which it, to which I've placed you. Mm. Pray to the Lord for it. Yeah. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And they think, whoa, really? We're supposed to pray for this wicked. And so we need to, and again, that's very consistent, isn't it, with uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, mm -hmm. we're to pray for those in authority. Yeah. So that's one thing we, we're supposed to do, not just get mad at, you know, this president and these, you know, these people yeah. aren't going the wrong, but to pray for them. 
Yeah. They are our leader. God is sovereign and they are our leaders and we need to pray for them because if our nation prospers, we are kind of like on the same ship of the Titanic, you know, if it hits the iceberg, we all go down sort of thing. And yeah. so we need to pray for them. But then, as you say, we need to work to spread the gospel. Like, yeah. you know, you do through evangelism and get people to come to faith. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if we had a revival and a spiritual awakening that That'd like we've awesome. had in the history of America? Sure. That just millions of people came to faith and our culture begins to change. To me, you know, government is a reflection of our culture mm -hmm. and our culture is a reflection of the health of the church, yeah. how effective we are to be salt and light. And so to me, the real message needs to be us to, to be the salt and light, to love God, love our neighbor and do whatever he calls us to do by his spirit. Yeah. And, uh, and you're doing that. And that's why I'm thankful for you and, oh. and uh, thankful for others that, that are not giving up. Yeah. But they're just saying, God, what do you want me to do today? And then do it through me. Yeah. For well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to creep you out. Uh, and if you can tell me if this is inappropriate, I feel like God actually uh, often reveals to me through the kind of visions. They're usually actually dreams because sure. I'm normally oh, asleep. And Go for I it. always have to test them out because sometimes I'm like, is it just the tacos that I ate that night? Or is this really <laughs> like a profound, you know, sure. vision? And I've had a couple, but one, one was, was very, uh, powerful to me. And it was some time ago, uh, maybe a little over a year ago, literally a year and a half. And I was uh, in the in the city setting. And all around me was chaos and people were weeping in the streets. And it was very dark and gray. And I remember looking up and I, and I saw on a flagpole, the American flag, and it was on fire. And mm -hmm. it, it was it was incredible. And people were just weeping. And like, it just it, I mean, it felt like, uh, you know, like the Capitol building was was in chaos and kind of like the riots that we saw, you know, not long ago, which sure, which, sure, you know, which sure. Was, and we saw those many times in many cities, not, yeah. not just in our own capital, right. But it was something yeah. along those lines. But there was this dome and it kind of reminded me of the, the chapel that's up in Mackinac Island. There's that kind of dome church thing that's there, that little structure yeah. you can go into. It sure. was something like that. Right. And there was okay. this warm fire there and it was, it was like the church and it was, a, I knew it was a safe place. So wow. I came in and I saw people were there and they were praying and it was a place of peace and the fires in the middle. And, but for my, my tendency, I ran out and I was calling people and trying to grab them by the hand to get them into this place of the church for peace. And so that I woke up and I was like, well, that was really frightening because it was very, you know, very much like a 3D kind of experience dream. Wow. Um, and I just, you know, took from that, again, the, the, the simple but powerful command to always remain as a missionary uh, in this culture. And so what I walked away with that from what, a, what I walked away from that dream was this idea that, okay, let's say, let's say you're a missionary and, and we should be thinking that way. Okay. And you, you get your missionaries training, and then you're sent off to a field. And if you're you're one of those, you know, really cool missionaries, you get to go off to some, you know, uh, you know, kind of uh, third world type experience, and you got to learn the culture and the language, and you know, still try to serve the gospel. And and man, I just am so uh, uh, envious of people like that. But that's really who we are. Like I feel like God. What if He plunked me down in this America at this time with all of this chaos going on around me? And said, I want you to learn how to speak the language, serve the people, and minister the gospel. I love it. And so that's how I've operated. Whether COVID came up or political strife or this election, that election, okay, I'm in this space at this time, Lord. How do I continue to minister to the gospel in the in the cultural setting that God has placed me? And that, that's the motive that drives me all the time. How do I serve as a missionary where I am? I love it. That is so good. And that's what all of us need to be doing. Yeah. There are so many hungry people that do not know Jesus around us. Mm -hmm. uh, on our website, grandawakening.com, I mean, we have a, a, a thing you can go to downloads. It's just an evangelism card. It's not perfect, but it's, it's like when you go fishing, you want to have some bait. It's a bait. It can show people. We've used it so many times, Marcia and I, my wife, and, yeah. and we've seen people pray to receive Christ as a result of that. And then it talks about how to grow. It's very simple, but it, it's, it's can be helpful, but we all need to be so many American Christians have never shared their faith with anyone. Right. And that needs to change. Would you yep. not agree? Well, if it didn't, if the, the friend who uh, uh, witnessed to me didn't, I wouldn't be here. 
you know, that's exactly right. Yeah. I'd be dead in my sin for sure. And yep. probably actually physically dead. So, yeah, no, uh, that's right. Yeah. But getting back, you know, I guess, you know, again, the topic is what is God saying to the church today? And yeah. I totally agree with you. I think as Christians, we need to pray for our leaders in all times. And yep. sometimes that's easier to do than others when, Hey, when your team is winning or whatever, you feel like, Oh, it's easier to pray for your leader than, you know, when it's not, but I think we need to pray for our leaders at all times, lifting them up, uh, for the wisdom of God to even fall over them, whether they confess, you know, Christ or, or not. And I think, I, you know, for the, for the most part, most of our, our at least top presidential leaders would say, you know, they, they know the Lord. Okay, great. Uh, the second one I would say is model, uh, a, a li living model, living a better story and especially in our marriages and in our mm. family. Okay. Amen. So Amen. one of the ways that I can sort of, in a sense, uh, combat, uh, the the gender confusion that maybe my kids are going to start to experience in their schools is to show them what an what it is to be an honest Christian man. Amen. And for my wife to to you know humbly and proudly represent what it is to be a godly woman, right? Yes. And to show them that's actually a better story than living kind of some ambiguous you know mm. uh, marriage or or a broken marriage. And so Good. I just say you know you know you got to live a better story so that the world looks and go. Okay, that that's actually good. That's actually good. And I'd say the other one is uh, against complacency, be an advocate for the values and virtues, first of all, that clearly align with scripture. Yep. And that's the reason that probably in the gender issue, that one kind of got me, uh, you know, up a little bit more. Because what we know about creation, God created, yes, he's the one who created it all. And he created them how? Male, male and female. And he created marriage yeah. between a male and a female. Right. That's it. Right. Yes. So I'm going to humbly but confidently advocate for that value and that virtue because it clearly aligns with scripture. Uh, and, and, you know, and again, in that sense, I, I feel fully confident in kind of driving into that one. And then the last one is, uh, you know, just to point others towards the peace that is found only in Christ. Uh, you just got to keep pointing people in that direction. I don't always have the opportunity to lead everyone I know to Christ, but right. I certainly want to at least keep pointing them towards the grace of Christ. Yep. They say it can take, uh, what, five, six, seven people to talk to someone before they actually make a commitment. You might be number two or three or four or whatever it is. So oh, I, can't, I, can, I can't tell you. And I, I, I've actually thought about it a few times, how many people tried to witness to me that failed miserably. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so yeah. good. Well, Simon, thank you for meeting with us. Why don't you uh, close us in prayer? Would you yeah, prefer some of these things that we've been talking about? Go right ahead. Well, Father, we thank you, first of all. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us to rejoice in the Lord always. And we would say it again, rejoice, put on a fresh joy. And Lord, would you let our gentleness be evident to all because we know the Lord is near. Father, I, I pray for anyone who can hear my voice right now who's anxious and fearful and discouraged because the word tells us do not be anxious about anything. That's right. But in every situation, with prayer and petition, even with thanksgiving, presenting your request to God. And God, with that thanksgiving, we thank you for our nation. We Amen. thank you for its heritage. We thank you for its promise. We thank you for its provision. We thank you, Lord, that you have favored this nation so well over mm -hmm. the many centuries that it has been. And Lord, I think you're not done. I think that our greatest days are still ahead. Lord, let this be a beacon of your peace. Amen. And may the peace of God, which transcends everything we can understand, guard our hearts and our minds always in Christ Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, return. Return first to our hearts, then yes. to our world. In your name, amen. 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 Simon, thank Thanks. you so much. Yeah. Great being with you. God bless you. You too, bud. Love you a lot. Thanks. <laughs>